Uh, so hello and welcome uh, to today's symposium. My name is Dr. Anthony Chow. I'm the director of the School of Information at San Jose State University, and I'm proud to sponsor and host today's event. Uh, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us, and the symposium is in honor and celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. The theme of our symposium is Latinos contributing to the fabric of our nation. And this is part of our ongoing equity, diversity, and inclusion series sponsored by the School of Information at San Jose State. SJSU was recently ranked number one in the nation as the best value for pursuing a college education in the United States. San Jose State is designated as an Hispanic serving institution, and our School of Information is also at 26% of Hispanic student enrollment and growing each year. SJSU iSchool is, in fact, the largest MLS program in the nation, if not the world, and is also by far the most diverse, as we are number one in all major racial groups, representing LIS students and libraries in 49 out of 50 states. For some reason, we can't break into West Virginia, but we're working on that. It's an enormous privilege and opportunity to discuss and address EDI as a national and global learning community. I'm sincerely grateful to our distinguished guests that are here with us today. We will start with the keynote address from Lloyd Garcia Febo, followed by individual presentations uh, from our impressive panel. So a uh, little bit about our keynote before I hand over to Lloyd. So Lloyd Garcia Febo is a Puerto Rican American librarian and international library consultant, expert in library services to diverse populations and human rights. She was the president of the American Library Association from 2018 to 2019 and is known worldwide for her passion about diversity, community, sustainability, innovation, and digital transformation, library workers, library advocacy, well, uh, health and wellness for library workers and new librarians about which she has taught in 44 different countries. In her job, she helps libraries, companies, and organizations strategize programs, services, and strategies and areas related to these topics and many others. Uh, Lloyda has a bachelor's in business education and a master's in library and information science. She was born, raised, and educated in Puerto Rico. And uh, she also is, uh, um, uh, she has been working with us as our health and wellness ambassador. And we really uh, are honored and privileged to work with Lloyda. So please join me in welcoming Lloyda Garcia Febo. Lloyda? Uh, thank you, Anthony, uh, Dr. Chow, and uh, welcome everyone. Bienvenidos. Why don't we, while we're waiting for Loida, why don't we go ahead and introduce our distinguished panelists? Uh, so if everyone doesn't mind, um, I'm, I'm just going to call on you based on where you are uh, on my uh, screen here. So, Elisa, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Elisa Garcia, and I'm the supervising librarian of the My Library NYC collections um, here at the New York Public Library. Happy to be here. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, Isabel? Hello, everyone. My name is Isabel Espinal. I work at the University of Massachusetts, <laughs> and I've been here for 25 years. Um, I am a librarian for multiple subjects, including Latin American, Caribbean, and Latinx studies. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Isabel. And uh, David. Hi, everyone. My name is David Lopez. I am the current Reforma National President. I work as a regional services manager in Orange County, California. Great, great to meet you, David. Uh, and I think um, as we're uh, still waiting for uh, Loida, uh, why don't we, I guess, uh, begin uh, a conversation as a panel? Um, and I'm not sure what prompts uh, Loida had prepared for you, um, but I, I, I guess I could start with um, really what Hispanic Heritage Month means to you. Uh, and, and why is it so important that we are here uh, celebrating and discussing it today? So I'll just start with that general prompt, maybe for each of you to to respond to. So what, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Uh, well, um, I guess I'll start. Uh, I'll, um, for me, I think like with every other observation and every celebration, um, Hispanic Heritage Month, Latinx 
Heritage Month uh, represents a celebration or an honoring of heritage, culture, language, people beyond just a single month, beyond just one day um, of observation. It is a reminder to have a daily practice or a daily honor to, you know, people who came before us, people who we work alongside every day and, you know, future generations of what we want our contributions to be on the world. Um, it is, you know, celebrating the successes and also the failures of our past and um, taking that in stride in, you know, creating a better future. I think that, um, you know, as people of color, as Latinos, we need to uh, remember that in everything that we do beyond a month and to remind people that, you know, while this is a month to celebrate and to honor, you know, just like with other folks and other people of color and other um, BIPOC folks, we need to uh, celebrate, elevate, you know, advance those voices every day. Wonderful, David. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. I really like what David said about that, you know, it shouldn't just be a month. And most of us are not just doing this. For a month, but that um, what it means to me is that at least it's one time to focus. And it's one time I know I've been a librarian for 30 years. So um, I remember when I first started and I got this advice from a mentor of mine who was a black librarian. And she said, you know what? Is there a is there a Hispanic Heritage Month? Because we got Black Heritage Month, and at least that's a place to start. Why don't we Why don't we find out and start with that? So it gave us a place to focus and start and tell my library, hey, we've never celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month. You know, let's start right. And so that gave me a place to start. Thank you, Isabel. That's that's wonderful, Elisa. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, it's a, a, a year-round uh, celebration, definitely. I'm a big believer in the celebration of just cultural heritage, not just my own, uh, but everyone's um, cultural heritage. So definitely a celebration for me uh, year-round um, because it is a representation of who I am, my family. Um, the work that I do is impacted um, by that as well. So for me, is uh, celebrating... Uh, that aspect of cultural um, heritage by representing who I am, um, the successes of of our people, but also our failures and what we can learn and what we can do to just become better as a, a society and just representation um, in general. So I, in my work, I'm very thoughtful of that, of everyone's um, cultural heritage and celebrating that um, through literacy and just also, I think showing uh, that uh, Latinx uh, folks, we come in all colors. Um, so not just um, a particular one. So I'm like a very proud Afro-Latina, I'm very proud of, of who I am and where my family uh, comes from. And I try to represent that in not only my work, but just in um, everything else that I, I do as well. It's one wonderfully said. Lisa, and, and I also wanted to mention as someone that is not from a Hispanic Latino background, what I love about these Heritage Months is really learning about other people and culture beyond my own worldview. So as a person of color, I think also sometimes what happens is life can be tough and it's very easy to, to focus on trying to survive, you know, your own struggles uh, as an Asian American. And so it's that's why it's such an honor and privilege to have these, uh, because ultimately uh, it's expanding my own worldview. Right. And, th and that is so important. And of course, it goes without saying that's the beauty of the United States. Right. That we come together uh, and, and, and really this is our country together. So anyway. Great to see you again, Loida. We were kind of just ab-living a little bit. Uh, so it's great to see you. And let me turn it back over to you, Loida. Fantastic um, question also. It's um, it's our um, privilege, right? And it also it's our honor to celebrate uh, each one every day. All right. I'm going to share my screen. And that's what happened last time. Somehow I got frozen. If this happens again, I will call on my cell phone and Alfredo has the presentation and then we will work that way. Um, Elisa said something and there is um, the technology, it's acting up, right? Maybe. <laughs> okay. 
Um, yes. So um, I will turn to um, full screen once a disk on my computer stops. Let's see if we make it this time. Well, again, bienvenidos, welcome, and happy Hispanic Heritage Month. Week, day, we celebrate every day. And today, the um, San Jose State University High School is hosting a Hispanic Heritage Month symposium. I am delighted to curate this symposium today. And thank you to Dr. Chow for the invitation and to the iSchool team for great support. Also, saludos to uh, San Jose State University President, Cynthia Teniente Matson. The Hispanic Heritage Month began as a week in 1968 to recognize the contributions of his, the Hispanic community that had gained momentum throughout the 1960s when the civil rights movement was at its peak and there was a growing awareness of the United States multicultural identities. In 1988, Congress passed a bill establishing the celebration from September 15 to October 15. There are a number of Latin American countries that celebrate their independence, uh, their national day on September 15. Now I will try to share my full. Unmute. Librarians have been being at the forefront of these movements too, the movements that gave way to the Hispanic Heritage Month. In 1971, Reforma, the National Association to Promote Library and Information Services was established by Dr. Anulfo Trejo and other amazing trailblazers. And here we have him, Dr. Anulfo Trejo and amazing library leaders that I hope you can see on my screen. And there we have uh, Elizabeth Martinez as well. Maybe I can put this at the bottom of my screen. Great. And we have had many amazing leader trailblazers that have led Reforma and also library services to Latinos nationwide. I wanted to take a moment for us to honor them. And some of these pictures go back, as you can see, there's a long history of Latinos, and in this case, represented by Reforma. And I know we're going to talk more about Reforma later. As per the census, the most recent data that we have is that there are 63.7 million of Hispanics, as the census classifies them, in the USA, making it the nation's largest racial or ethnic minority, 19.1% of the total population. There are 13 states with 1 million or more Hispanics residents, and this is by 2022, that's the most recent data, Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Washington. And the median age is 30.7 years. 30 years. Hispanics, Latinos are young. To echo scholars, Latino 
refers to those who are from or have background in a Latin American country. And these terms encompass culture, ethnicity, and identity, and are rooted in shared cultures and not racial categories. On the 2020 census form, people were counted are as Hispanic or Latino or even Spanish if they could identify as having Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicano, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or another Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. That's what the census says. Latinx is a more recent term, um, and it's a gender and LGBTQ inclusive term. And there is more literature about this, but uh, this is the gist of these um, different terms for us and for our purposes today to understand. When using one of these terms, Latino, Latin, Hispanic, to refer to a specific person, always respect their preference. When in doubt, ask respectfully. For example, I consider myself a Latina. I prefer that term, but I'm not opposed to Hispanic or Latinx either. It is important to note that Latinos have a different beautiful heritage. I am of Greek heritage. We have colleagues that are Mexico-Iranian, Chinese-Mexican, German-Venezuelan, and so on. And this is one of the reasons why Reform International Relations Committee kicked off this year Hispanic Heritage Month with a virtual event on the Chinese experience in Latin America. The Reforma Afro-Latina Affinity Group will present an event about the Puerto Rican African scholar Arturo Schomburg. And earlier this year, we presented an event about library information services supporting human rights, where we feature colleagues from um, Iran, um, from Afghanistan, Iran, and uh, from Ukraine. Latinos have made significant and transformative contributions to librarianship in this country. Let's recognize now the amazing strides by Latinos. Si se puede. We had a Latina as executive, as an executive director of the American Library Association. We had a Latina. Um, as the first director of the ELA Office for Diversity and Spectrum Scholarship Initiative. And that was Sandra Rios Valderrama, right here. And the executive director of the American Library Association, Elizabeth Martinez, right here. We currently have Latinos and Latinas as library directors in academic and public libraries. We have many dedicated library leaders in all types of libraries. We have library leaders. We have had library leaders such as Camila Lire and Luis Herrera, for example, uh, com as committee members appointed by the White House to different uh, committees. As I mentioned, the foundation of Reforma was a major milestone. Reforma and Latinos have successfully united forces with librarians from other ethnic groups uh, in the Joint Council of Librarians of Color. Collaboration with ALA's Association for Library Services to Children, ALSC, allow us to create the Pura Vel Pre Award. And these are things that reform us spearheaded, but these are wins and successes for Latino librarians nationwide. This award, the Pura Vel Pre Award, 
is presented to a Latino or Latina writer and illustrator whose best portrays, whose work portrays, affirms, and celebrates the Latino cultural experience in an outstanding work of literature for children and youth. Latinos have been and are still very much present supporting the importance of library and information services for everyone. Since uh, advocating for rights of migrant workers many years ago to now that we continue to advocate for the rights of immigrants, access to information about sexual and reproductive health, and free access to information, including topics such as women, indigenous populations, gender, climate, financial literacy, digitization, food security, and financial security. Si se puede. Librarians are a key part of the force that brought us the Chicano studies to the UCLA trailblazers for example, and the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at the Hunter College in NYC in New York City. Latino librarians are in NASA together with stellar Latino astronauts. And there we have it, Jamira Santiago. We are, and this is a, a moment to share a bit of my work, we have been advocating at the United Nations presenting the first program by librarians there. We are at the European Union Parliament, at Los, at Los Angeles City Hall, on radio, on TV. This is an example, but there are so many Latinos doing amazing things out there, Latino librarians. During the pandemic, we were one of the first ones to provide a safe online place for our librarians to be in community with the librarians in quarantine, which I had the honor to coordinate with an amazing, dedicated team of library workers. Yes, big applause to all of you Latino librarians. We recognize your contributions. We um, salute you today. We also have challenges. La lucha sigue. And I will mention some of them. Where are you from? Refers to this type of disagreement, perhaps, among Latinos about country, citizenship, educational degrees, skin color, morenita, tigreñita, Afro-Caribeña, texture of the hair, lacio, rizado, Afro. Do they speak Spanish, Spanglish? Oh, mortal sin, they do not speak Spanish. How much Spanish do I need to speak? Where I need to be born to be Latino enough? The immigration situation, one of the saddest things on earth. We need a national um, good faith approach to take inclusive action for our brothers and sisters stuck in this situation. The hundreds of unaccompanied children at detention centers is a travesty, a huge challenge, but which Reforma has taken action. So please visit the page and I will make a call right now to provide support. There is also, unfortunately, a list of challenges impacting our communities. Climate action, racial equity, health care, well-being, gender-based violence, women empowerment, quality education, decent work and economic growth, salary equity, and reducing inequalities. They are all part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals which are really a call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and improve the lives and prospects of everyone everywhere. Each one of the 17 goals come with targets. And the 17, goal 17, is the one that gives guidance on how to implement and move development sustainability forward. 
So we all have the opportunity to get into this work. Recently, we have been seeing how technology is posing increasing challenges. We don't want our communities to be left behind. And just yesterday, I read how IBM plans to train uh, 2 million people in artificial intelligence with a special focus on underrepresented communities. Librarians ought to be at that table. This new wave of digital transformation has implications for society and for Latinos, who are the largest minority in this country. This is also posing questions about social justice and techno solutionism. Is that providing all our solutions and responses in, in technology? Digital access by marginalized or vulnerable groups, we need to find perhaps better terms. Um, concerns about the dissolution of human to human relationships, there is a huge problem in the world right now. Um, people are feeling lonely. And loneliness is a major priority for the UN, for the World Health Organization as well and for the CDCs here in the United States. They have developed guidelines and manuals and videos on how we can connect to each other. It's a, it's a big situation. Awareness of the increase of monitoring and control, surveillance, right? Maybe you are now afraid of saying something near your phone because then next, next you see a, an advertisement on how to buy the item you mentioned. Also the impact of well-being, acceptance, self-image, addiction, tech dependency, and self-care. These are all impacting humans on the planet and Latinos are part of these humans. So we also need to think about these challenges and the opportunities they pose for libraries. What is the way forward then? There is no magic formula. There is step by step, holding hands, little by little, moving the needle. This week, we have the United Nations General Assembly underway here in New York. Streets are closed and presidents of many countries have arrived in the city. In the opening of the assembly, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, declared that this is a time to righting historic wrongs, healing divisions and putting our world on a path to lasting peace. Last year, during the UN High-Level Political Forum on Development and Sustainability, which are part of the, um, the 17 goals I shared earlier, the priority was about how do to the world social and political chaos, pandemics and wars, how do to that we must do business unusual, which allow me to translate. We cannot do business as usual. These are different times. We need different strategies. The way forward then is united. There is no other way. It is indeed true that there is strength in numbers. The writing of historic wrongs is action united. Moving the needle, strategizing, partnering, building coalitions, one step at a time. Healing divisions, little by little, upholding our values, promoting human rights, taking actions towards peace. It can work like a cascade or a domino effect at home, in the street, in the block, in the community, the county, city, state, nation, world. It sounds ideal and a bit abstract, 
but librarians are taking steps every day to strengthen social cohesion of our communities and our country. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Librarians are supporting many communities that we serve, are supporting libraries, mentoring newer librarians, newer leaders, peer mentoring each other, those that have attained saint level, they don't need anyone, but I do. I still need my peer mentoring. That's where the awesome sauce is birthed. The way forward is supporting other librarians. This is not the time to unsupport librarians, no matter whom the person is. We shall work united, supporting libraries, as I mentioned, supporting each other, mentoring, supporting communities. And rule number one is that we stick together. These are challenges, the one I mentioned, and opportunities that we must face together. And we must give a seat to newer librarians, newer leaders, to all types of library workers, librarians, paraprofessionals, to women, to those not usually heard or listened to. Also, we got to take a moment to listen to unions. Do we understand unions in our profession in this country? That's a question for each one of us. We are not alone facing these challenges and opportunities. These are not unilateral challenges. These are cross borders, cross sectors that require cross border, cross sector solutions, multi-sectoral political will, changing paradigms, commitment, strong partnerships and collective action. Therefore, Let's strive to, and I am including in this uh, myself in these recommendations, let's strive to leave no one behind, change paradigms, promote policy transformation, multi-sectoral alliances, multi-dimensional processes, and secure a seat at the table for libraries and librarians to advocate. And if you know me and you have heard me before, this is part of my regular speech. It's very important. How we do this? Collaborating with different library associations, regional library groups, across types of libraries, across disciplines and research, with public and private agencies, strategizing ways of reaching out to elected officials, building those coalitions, building community among ourselves. And it is not magic. We got to put time and effort and we can. Si se puede. Librarians have been collaborating following these principles in different ways for a long time. So let's reflect. Let's recharge our energy with the successes achieved by our elders and by ourselves too. I want to encourage everyone to celebrate who we are, who you are uh, during this Latino uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, Latino Month. We are amazing. Si se puede. La lucha sigue. We can move mountains. And we have done it many times before, and we can do it again. Unidos, united, si se puede. And now we are going to hear more in our conversation with our colleagues, our guest speakers, on ways in which we can perhaps achieve that, how we can learn from examples, models, from experience, from different types of uh, librarians. Welcome to our speakers, and thank you so much to all of you that are watching on YouTube or on Zoom. It's great. We have really wonderful speakers today. 
And um, we are really thrilled to collaborate today with Reforma. Um, it's a great collaboration, good partner. And we are very happy that David Lopez, president of Reforma National is with us today. We also have Isabel Espinal, um, a really uh, dear colleague for many, many years from Armhurst uh, University in, the, I should say University of Massachusetts at Armhurst. It's a beautiful place, I've been there. And Elisa Garcia from New York Public Library. Between all of us, we are representing experiences from library associations, um, from academic, public, school librarians, and services to these populations. And also, we have um, experiences from other parts of our lives that we are bringing together today. So let's start our conversation. And this conversation, to me, um, is very interesting because uh, we are all bringing our our lives, experiences, and work to it. So let's dig in. How do you see Latinos contributing to the fabric of the nation? And uh, this is right how we are strengthening our society. Each one of you brings different experiences to show our valuable contributions. And I will start with David Lopez. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Loida. Thank you for that great keynote. Uh, some really great information. So um, we're going to hopefully pull from that to, for in today's conversation. Uh, this question is is a tough question because it's so it's so broad and so general, but also there's so much to say, right? Um, specifically, how are Latinos contributing to the fabric of the nation? Well, in every specific way, in every way possible, um, I uh, can um, speak on behalf of people raised in Southern California where Latinos are very plentiful. I grew up in an area where, um, you know, everybody looked like me, everybody sounded like me. Um, and so I acknowledge that everyday working folks in every field um, from the bottom up from, you know, um, maintenance folks to people in leadership to people in administration to people in academia um you see them um but there's still not enough of them right um i think that the contributions that are made by latinos um are oftentimes not appreciated in the way that um you see it celebrated in other um areas and that's because we're sometimes the silent giants, right? We're the ones that are making the things happen. We are the ones that are, you know, putting in the long hours, working graveyard shifts, um, working multiple jobs to make wheels turn um, because um, there's an absolute necessity. Um, we could chalk it up to cultural um, responsibility or experience, but I think we are a people of uh, pulling ourselves up from the bootstraps and making things happen. And you see that at all levels in different ways. And, um, you know, something as simple as going to a restaurant um, is a great contribution to the way that Latinos are perceived because you can communicate with someone um, and get your point across and feel heard and be seen. And something like that, an interaction as simple as speaking to somebody in your native language can make a whole lot of difference. And I speak from somebody who grew up in an area where um, I did not take that for granted as a son of immigrants from Mexico. You know, I always was my parents' translator everywhere I go. You know, even now my parents are, are aging and they're ill and I am their translator still. And that's all because I was able to, that was ingrained in me to be able to help them and that, you know, being a Latino, you know, it begins in the home, it begins in the heart, and um, we take that everywhere we go. So I'm, I don't know, it's such a huge question, right? We could go on forever about this, but I'll let somebody else speak. 
Yes, um, you're making me almost cry because this is a reality that we experience in our Latino households um, with our um, neighbors, with our friends, the cousin, the friend of the cousin that moved to live here in Brooklyn needs me. So, um, you know, this is a very kind of also um, service, caring, uh, love um, culture as well. Um, Isabel. Okay, yes, I had things to say, but I'm going to just continue to riff off of what David just said. So, so much that you said, David, um, I want to highlight that issue of translation. I was also that child. And, and what I realized is that that is a contribution that our children are making. <laughs> Like we contribute starting from the time we're children. Thank you for saying that. But also, you know, the flip side, when you said that our contributions are not appreciated, I feel like who is appreciating the fact that as children, we're put in that position. Sometimes it's not a good position to put a child in, to be honest with you, because it's a lot of pressure. I mean, you and I are proud that we do that. And we still do that. Like, now that I'm in my fifties, but I did that when I was five, you know, six years old and, um, and there are children today doing that. So I think that there's so much of our experience that we need to talk about. So I'm so glad you talked about this. I was not planning to talk about it. Um, and then that point that you made about contributions that are not appreciated. I think it goes at every level. Like our experience is not appreciated at every level. And I, I, I've definitely seen that. I've been a librarian since 1991. So, you know, 32 years of this. And I have felt it personally, like, wow, I'm not always appreciated in certain spaces. But one thing is with Reforma. So thank you for, be, for you know, holding Reforma down, you know, I think uh, Loyla, you were president and I was president. Reforma to those people that that Loyla was showing in those in those images, those are the people that did appreciate me. So I always felt I had a home and I was appreciated thanks to Reforma. Okay, so this is how I was going to answer the question before I heard what David had to say. So I was going to talk to David about the different education levels and how people contribute no matter what their education, no matter what their profession. I think of my own parents. They make such a contribution and they had no education. But what they contributed is and, and I think this is a gift that I that I learned and that we're all, we've all learned what they contributed is is this idea of like joy inclusivity you include everybody you bring everybody in um things that you know companies have to pay somebody to teach their workers my parents taught me <laughs> they taught me i mean they were teaching dei in the house right so there's a lot of strengths that we have and that we bring that to our workplace um, and, uh, even things like the fact there's parts of our culture. So for example, if you, if you're a librarian, those of you who are, you know, going to become librarians, you go to conferences, the Reforma conferences, a very important aspect is when we dance together, we dance, there is joy. And for Latinx Heritage Month, um, one of the things I did this year is we have we have this plaza outside the library, and I've always had this vision that let's dance on the plaza of the library, right? That nobody ever did that before. <laughs> and, you know, it took a little bit of, you know, we had to get the tech, but all you really need is music, and we start dancing. And the students, our Latinx Cultural Center, which is run by students, they were teaching everybody. So, what Anthony uh, Chow said earlier about, you know, he comes from an Asian culture and he wants to learn. We had that. We had Asian people, South Asian. We had white people. We had Europeans. We had Latino people that never learned how to dance. We're learning how to dance. So even, you know, um, within our culture, as you said, there's a lot of of diversity and you cannot take for granted the Latinos are going to know one thing or be one thing. They're not all going to speak English or Spanish or, or, or even either of those, because a lot of people from Latin America speak indigenous languages. So um, I think that those are the things that resonated with me. Um, also intellectually, we have strong 
um, intellectual tradition. So it, we are people of the heart, but also of the intellect. So um, I will leave it at that. We there's like David said, there's so much that you know we only have a few minutes. So I'm going to stop with that and let um, Elisa speak. Thank you, Isabel, um, and thank you, Loida, for that for the invitation. So, um, just going along that same vein, uh, I want to talk about uh, the women, uh, the Latina women, especially. I was raised by my grandma, my mom, my tias, so and they played a big role in me growing up. So that was like that was that because it was like that group of women um, who you know who raised me who who elevated me, but also uh, supported me to become who I was and always never ashamed of who I was and supported throughout my schooling. And just that support, but that, um, like that strong um, bond there of all these women who were surrounded. So I could go to my tia, I could go to my grandma, I could go to my madrina, las comadres. So that's an important part of, of growing up um, Latino, Latinx, that's very part, that's important in our culture. So definitely, so it's like when, one of the jokes is like when you go to a, a, a party of a Latino household, it's like, it takes you like two hours to say goodbye because there's so many, um, so many folks that you can to. So I just want to, I just want to put that out there that the women um, in our families play a big role in, in keeping the families together and bringing, um, and bringing us together. Um, and that was my case. So, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, I also want to talk about like the, the people from like the, the bodegas, the supermarkets. If you think of those folks that are there, it's like, those are the people who have built, especially in New York city, um, that culture of like, you can go to like, well, like bodegas or like your second family is there. Like you go and you can talk and it's like, you know, like you're just saying like, hi, to me. So definitely that. So there's so many contributions, but I think, um, one of the major contributions, I think that my family, that I'm so glad that I never lost that was the fact that I always spoke Spanish at home and I never lost my ability to to speak the language and read it because it has helped me tremendously in my job and being able to to do things that possible that weren't couldn't be possible if I didn't speak the language fluently um, in that understanding. So being able to help students who um, are learning um, English for the first time, being able to conduct classes in Spanish, um, being able to now develop a collection and fully understand the materials that I am selecting for this collection because I'm able to speak the language. I'm able to understand the learning abilities of the new incoming students. So definitely, um, that's a it's a major contribution that I feel that I'm thankful for um, for my family for never losing um, losing that and making sure that I I stay consistent in speaking the language. I I um I appreciate um all your different um, contributions at this time and I wanted to say that um, besides being a public librarian, Eliza is also um, serving school libraries in New York City. And so it's a very interesting uh, dynamic there when she said, I'm uh, purchasing these books and reading these books because these books might be recommendations for school libraries as well. So it's a very interesting um, type of work that you're doing, contributing not only public, but also school libraries, which is not um, something that public all public libraries in the nation uh, can do. And so it's a bit a special to the New York Public Library, and it's, uh, it's, it's great that you can um, contribute like that to our children in the city. I, um, I want to thank all of you for these amazing um, examples and on how Latinos are contributing to our uh, the fabric of the nation. And as a Puerto Rican woman, I have perhaps uh, some maybe different experiences. And this is the, the richness, right, of what our conversation today. Um, we um, in Puerto Rico, which is part of the nation, but it's, you know, it's a territory, it's a colony. Um, so this is a different element to this conversation in Latinos. Um, there are... Um, Puerto Rican women that have served the nation in different ways and um, in ways that are a bit sad, that have moved perhaps science forward, but um, that are things that have affected our uh, women and our population. So that is also contributing to our society 
that is also um, contributing and strengthening the fabric of the nation, but there is a cost. And so we also have to talk about successes in challenges and, and these are also aspects that have affected our populations. For instance, uh, Puerto Rican women uh, were used to test birth control pills um, many years ago, and um, many of them uh, suffer different conditions um, about, you know, related to that. But Another side, uh, Puerto Rico also provided lands for military exercises. Um, factories in the island, mainly pharmaceuticals, provided um, huge, huge um, um, jobs, numbers of jobs for the islanders, and even um, shoe factories. And so there are many pieces of um, medicines and components that are factory in the island. And during the pandemic, that stopped a little bit. And for uh, a moment, there was um, a scarcity of those resources because they were not produced in the island. So we are all bringing these different experiences that are very, very uh, different in some uh, cases, but they are part of our Latinos, Hispanics, and Latins. And we need to talk about this and tell these stories. And um, our guests at any moment, they can also jump in into this type of uh, conversations today. And so with that said, and those different examples that are, I want to stress, they are very different because we are a very uh, diverse uh, group. Let's talk about following that same line, um, and how Latinos have left an indelible mark on this country. Uh, specifically now, we talked about a bit about society and the nation and um, successes and, and challenging uh, situations, right? But now let's talk about how can libraries better support Latinos and the Spanish speakers. They're at and lifelong learning. And I will um, now um, like to start with Isabel. Okay, so yeah, I, I was thinking along different lines. There are a lot of needs that, the that people in the community have, and there's certain informational needs that might be different from other people in the community. So I think every community, you really have to look at what are people's needs or what might they need to learn. if. I mean, do you have a lot of children translating for their parents? Maybe the library can even offer something there um, to go along the lines of what you said, Loy, that, you know, business, not business as usual, but business unusual. Um, a lot of us in this room here, we've done translation in our jobs, and that's not in our job description, right? You know, and maybe that needs to be a new service, right? So that's an example. But I remember when I was in the public library, there were a lot of local people that didn't know how to buy a house. They didn't know how to save up for a house or how do you how do you navigate this bureaucracy? And so so we would have programs along those lines. But then there's other needs. Like right now at the university, there are intellectual and emotional needs. Um, last year for Latinx Heritage Month, I did a program with a Dominican Afro-Indigenous uh, writer who had a program on writing from the roots. And she helped people to, to dig deep. She's also a psychotherapist. Her name is Marianela Medrano, by the way. Um, and, you know, it touched on, yes, an intellectual need, but also, and a cultural need, but also a psychological need. So th that was a program that I talked to students afterwards and they said, wow, I, I didn't realize my shoulders dropped and I felt this relaxation. I didn't realize what I was carrying. Um, and David, I'm in a different place from Los Angeles or New York City where I'm from. Here it is a predominantly white institution. So I think that there's, in a place like that, you have to know that, th that there are certain burdens that, that your Latinx community might be feeling, your Hispanic, Latino, whatever you want to use that might be feeling. Um, and then um, intellectually, so, Loida, I'm going to thank you publicly because you're one of the people that helped me understand 
really pay attention to our indigenous heritage in the Caribbean. Because of the way you introduce yourself sometimes, when you introduce yourself, you introduce yourself as a Taina, as, you know, having the heritage, Mm -hmm. the indigenous heritage, and that you're one of those people, not the only person who helped me to, to realize that. So out of that came an intellectual project that I've been working on, which is (laughs) uncovering Taino heritage Mm -hmm. for people of Caribbean descent it's very, it's become very popular and it's a very deep, both emotional and intellectual need. Um, and I'm actually teaching a class on that. So, you know, I'm doing a whole lot of stuff with that. Um, but I would say that libraries need to really be attuned. And you mentioned earlier, but it, it's worth saying, you know, the intersectionality, the, the issues of race, the issue of sexuality, the issues of disability, the issues of language, you know, it's not just Spanish, English, it's there are many languages and there are people who have indigenous languages and, you know, their needs are need to be attuned to as well. Um, and also that life that in that the program needs to be culturally relevant. So st- even to this day, believe it or not, Loida, those of us that are former, you know, been doing this for decades, but in many libraries, they, they still don't know that they need to do culturally relevant programming. <laughs> and, you know, um, like this last this very simple event that I did with this dancing, it was just incredible that students, when they heard the music, we did it outside so they would hear this Latin music, like, and they were like, it just drew them to us because that doesn't normally happen on this campus. So that was so simple for us, right? But so profound because it was culturally relevant. I'm going to say one last thing. I am looking at spaces in the library. How do you make the space culturally relevant to Latinx communities? So I am, I've been deep into this and I am proposing to my library that we create a Latinx and Iberian heritage because that's another community that's sort of related, but it's, you know, it's not always the same. Latinx and Iberian heritage community reading room in the library. You know, that would physically be culturally relevant. So uh, that's that's a project I'm working on right now. So that's I'll leave it at that because I know I really want to hear what everyone else has to say. I love that. Um, spaces are very important, right? Um, there are some libraries that have looked into living rooms and how we can adapt our reading spaces to kind of be perceived as living rooms because people feel comfortable in those spaces. And when you mentioned these uh, spaces, how they can be culturally relevant to Latinx, it's it's important. This is part of what we do. Our I will say business, so to speak, right? How we make people feel uh, welcome and according to um, what we, through research, as you're doing, doing right, um, um, find that will make them feel welcome. Um, I want to not abandon our question, but I want to just continue a little bit with um, something you mentioned about race. And uh, we have a good time today to kind of jump in here and then resume this conversation on uh, the other topic of libraries. Um, Yes, uh, I am uh, very interestingly enough, Exactly. We have done this study many years ago, a quarter Greek, a quarter Taina, um, uh, Afro-Caribbean and Spaniard. And that is something very uh, interesting, but it's very present in my family. And so that is uh, the tr- our truth. And um, in the census that we just basically um, answered the entire nation, uh, Latinos marked um, 27.6 million of Latinos marked that they had two or more races. And um, and I said Latinos, but really the um, classification from the Census uh, Bureau is Hispanic. And that is very interesting because we have white, black, or uh, 
Hispanic. And then within that, then you, uh, there are spaces where people can mark if they are Chicano or Puerto Rican or um, then racist. And um, how do we serve those populations, right? It's a very diverse uh, a group of people. This is this one that we have, the Latinos or Hispanics. And um, you mentioned, uh, Isabel mentioned about the uh, cultural relevant space. Um, when I worked at a public library, we uh, made an effort to select materials that were in Quechua, that were in other languages from Mexico, that were different um, indigenous languages, and they weren't always available as we could maybe find mainstream books. Um, maybe the ink was a little paler. Maybe the, um, the page wasn't as thick. The, um, the book, maybe the binding was a little bit different, but the products, the item existed. And we made an effort to acquire for our uh, patrons because they spoke that language. That was their first language. In some cases, they didn't speak Spanish and they didn't speak English, but they were here in our communities. So it's a big effort in some cases. And um, you have to um, catalog it in-house. You have to create a cataloging yourself. You can't just pull up OCLC or Library of Congress because it doesn't exist. So it's it adds a bit of work to our regular routine. And then you have the, um, you know, the, the data for the systems besides the cataloging, how best to make that discoverable for our patrons. And so these are um, uh, details and considerations that we also need to factor in. And it's kind of easy to say, well, that's very difficult. We're not going to go that route. But um, I want to explore this a little bit um, at this time with the speakers, because I know you all have some type of experience with acquisition or, or you know, and colleagues in different departments. And um, even though our indigenous groups are not uh, huge numbers, we have them in our communities. So I'm going to ask you to think a little bit on how are you, have you served them? And if you could share that um, this afternoon with our um, attendees. Um, yes, and so another another uh, point is that the Guadalajara Book Fair was a great source to acquire uh, some of these books and materials. Um, yes, and I will go to Elisa because I think she might be um, doing this almost every in daily basis, uh, <laughs> reviewing um, items. Um, yes, Elisa. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's a, a great question, definitely, for sure. So uh, the collection I currently oversee um, has uh, 30 plus languages over um, are part of this, this Spine Library NYC collection. Um, but in regards to your um, specific question, I think it's getting um, definitely uh, being open to learning about who are the members of your community, the folks that you are are coming to your your location and 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 what are they reading? What are their needs and, and things like that? So definitely that. Um, I think in this current role that I have, my my deci selecting decision is definitely based, of course, on, on New York City um, and all of the students that are part of the New York City um, the public school system, but also on like the needs, diversity of language, um, interest, and 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 high level, and connecting this with with students that are able to still be part of the of the fabric of of reading while feeling um, accepted and welcome, which I think is that. So definitely, I'm doing this on a daily basis. But even if you don't have a buying power or a power of, of, of selection, you can start by creating little pockets of special collections within your public library. So for example, if you are um, not the selector, you can definitely talk to the people who select and buy books for your um, location. But if you know, for example, let's say that you have like a, a community that's a very heavily like Dominican community, you can like 
put together like books by um, authors of, of Dominican heritage. Um, you can, you know, find books from, from Haiti, from the Caribbean, from, from places like this and put those um, together so that people know that these books are, are available, but also for other patrons to learn from these, um, from these cultures. So, so yeah, so definitely like do your research, um, be open to trying uh, indie presses, new vendors, but also make sure that what you're selecting is culturally responsible and relevant. So not just buying materials just because, oh, this checks the box off because it's um, it's Spanish, it's um, it's this dialect. So I'm very um, meticulous about that. And which is why I love collection development so much because I'm not just going to buy a book on the, just to put it on the shelf so that I can say, oh, I checked off the box of the, of the 10, 50 Spanish books that we need. So that's the only thing that I would ask um, my colleagues is just to be um, mindful of, of that and respect. Very, very important. And of course, we know that there's not only uh, collections, we have uh, programming, forums, symposiums that we can also um, coordinate as part of the um, access to information experience that libraries provide in academic, public, uh, school libraries. Uh, David, what are the things that come to mind? Unrelated to collection development, I have a story that I always love to tell because it is something that really surprised me as, a, as an early librarian where I was able to create a connection between an elder in my hometown library with a person, a family member in his native uh, country of Mexico, um, just by access to technology. Um, I, you know, early in my career was supervising um, a library satellite site that had a computer lab. Um, and we were having a difficult time starting up programming for, you know, using at that time it was Skype. Skype was the was the program that we were all trying to push, right? So um, we developed um, curriculum and we were trying to really tap into like this uh, community of seniors primarily in this area that you know I know how to work so well with now but at the time um, we were finding a disconnect right but what I found very surprising was that this person didn't imagine that they ever had somebody that they could ever use that program Skype to communicate with until we noticed that he kept coming back um, to ask more questions. And after about several weeks, he came back to us in Spanish and asked if we could help him create a Skype account and walk him through the, the process. And um, what we found was like a very heartwarming um, program um, that was for one person uh, to facilitate him to be able to actually see his mother that he hadn't seen physically in 25 years um, on the other side of that Skype. So he had been communicating over the phone with like a relative who was helping her get set up by virtue of us educating him on how to use the program. And they were uh, communicating in Zapoteco, right? So, um, the native um language for them um, outside of Spanish, which we wouldn't have been able to facilitate because we don't we don't speak the dialect. Right. But um, for that, that's one of my favorite stories, because at that time, you know, the struggle of, you know, trying to get a program, you know, for a community kind of turned itself into um, you know, we forget that sometimes community tells us what they need, what they want out of something. We are so focused on policy and statistics and data that sometimes one connection, you know, means the world for people. And in this particular case, it was somebody, you know, from a, a native language outside of my scope of understanding. Um, but I was so glad and, you know, I carry that story. It's one of my favorite stories in, in, for my career. So I love that. It's, it's so important what you said to be attuned to the community and not so much what we think they need. And we have said this so many times, but it still happens that, you know, we go with what we think and see we as the librarians, you know, uh, may go with what they think the community needs rather than uh, taking that time and um, investigating and, you know, going through the gatekeepers and connecting with community groups and different stakeholders to really find out what they need. Um, I do have a story. If I could say something to that. Yes, though, Isabel. Is that on the other hand, 
because we live in these communities and we work with these communities, we do have good instincts. It's like what Elisa was saying, you know the language. So sometimes I feel that those of us, once you like really know, you're you're very immersed. It's like a back and forth. It's like, oh, do you do you think this Latin dancing is gonna would that would I ask the students, you would you be interested in that? Oh yes, we want to do that. And then we did it and we didn't know if anybody was going to come. And then I, people would tell us. So it's like a, a, a conversation. And yes. so I, I would say to people, if you're very immersed, yeah. also, you know, if you want to do something that comes from you, check it out with your community. It might be something they can really relate to. So um, I just need to, I wanted to say that. Yes, it's, it's very important. It's very important. Um, it, so, <clears throat> yes, there is a story. Of a librarian that I met briefly um, at the um, at a recent conference this summer, and she developed a zine. It's a zine in an indigenous language, and she is a, a, a librarian. And I want to say it's Santa Clara or Santa Ana. It's in it's in California, but it's at a at a higher um, ed um, institution. And uh, the zine is in an indigenous language. I think it's from Mexico as well. And it was based because um, her grandmother, um, I think, uh, was from this town and she went with uh, a college kind of research uh, team and that developed into the zine that is being like Isabel now. It's, a, it's part of a, some type of a research at a library, um, academic library level. So there are different avenues in which we can impact our communities. And when these communities are here in the states, in the country we reside, we are strengthening our societies through the work that we do, um, including the um, Latino indigenous communities. And so now I would like to go back to um, this uh, question of libraries, but it was it was so important to me to really expand on the indigenous point that um, Isabel made. Yes. And through that, we also have left an indelible mark in the country. So um, I still am very interested in how David think that how can libraries better support Latinos and the Spanish speakers in their education and lifelong learning, which is something that we sort of preach uh, constantly as well that we do. And we do. Thank you, Loida. Uh, I strongly feel that the number one thing that we could do first before even reaching out to community is to hire and recruit Latinos and other people of color. Um, you have no idea what difference it makes just to go in to an institution to be able to see someone like you, to that somebody that sounds like you, that has maybe a shared experience, that that is the connection that sometimes is lacking. Most of the time is lacking when you go into a space, you know, in areas where I live in, for example, um, a lot of people are immigrants. They are afraid to go into government facilities, especially a library. The, the misunderstanding of the misinformation surrounding libraries um, can easily be um, appeased or calmed by, you know, a Latino, a Spanish speaker, somebody, uh, a person of color who they can relate to. Um, so uh, before, you know, programming and services come into play, I think institutions really have to focus on the recruitment and retention of Latinos to be able to bring them into their institutions at all levels. We're talking pages, clerks, library assistants, librarians, administrators, and directors. We're not talking about just the worker bees, right? We're talking about people who are creating policy, who are creating programs for the Latinos, for those communities that we're looking into. Um, we need to provide appropriate training, um, uh, create an EDI framework so that they know that they're safe at the workplace as well, because without that, community will not respond. I mean, it will buckle if there is not enough representation in the places that they are going to. Um, and, you know, with that comes the celebration of staff. Please let them know that they have to um, feel appreciated. They have to feel seen and heard 
and also the patrons. So, you know, I know it's a lot to have all of these observances every month and it feels (laughs) like there's always something, right? It's National Pizza Day, it's National (laughs) Donut Day, you know, but just like we said in the beginning, the celebration of Latino, Hispanic, Latinx month goes beyond a day, beyond a month. Our patrons and library users should be celebrated every day for who they are and for what they are. And that can be seen in the programs that we're offering, in the co- the collections that we're building, in the services that we're bridging them, in the partnerships that we're developing within the community. Um, because with that, you know, we can create advocates. We can help them in their lifelong journeys and education and learning. If they want to learn how to sew, if they want to learn how to garden, may it be in their language of preference and their, you know, in their, oh, on their own terms, right? We're going to tell them, here are the resources you use them at your disposal. Um, and as people of color in library institutions in, in various capacities, it is our obligation to take up space, you know, if we are not given the opportunity to sit at a table, we bring a chair to the table on our own terms to create the space so that we can get those policies created so that we can be the person. Sometimes it's hard to be a gatekeeper. It's hard to be a token person, but you know what? I am so glad that there was somebody like that for me to see and to understand that it is a possibility. So by virtue of just us being in libraries, we have the power to create that change, to create those connections so that people can understand that libraries are for them, are because of them. And, you know, that's that's what we can do. Preach, David. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Um, Elisa, what would be your um, your uh, take? <laughs> yeah, no, I I think um, definitely um, kudos to to David. Um, yeah, so definitely um, second second all of all of that. Um, I think um, the perspective that I will bring to definitely um, hiring the staff that um, that speaks the the language, but definitely learning and 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 seeing what what. Getting to know your community very closely, I think it's important whether you're working with, with students, um, with their patrons that come in, the parents of, of students, I should say, or the general public, however you are, are working with. So learning what their needs are, of course, like the, you know, and what you believe that they're, you know, and what you see, what they're asking for as you're paying attention and all of that. Um, but also introducing them to, to new things, um, not putting... Um, them in a box, not putting our patrons in a box and being like, well, you know what, because they're Latinx, they're Latinos, um, th- this is all they want to do and this is all they want to learn. So not putting them. So I've always been very open to, to that and trying new things because you'd be surprised, you know, the things that um, folks might be interested in. So definitely don't put um, your your patrons in a box based on their, their cultural um, heritage or lived experiences. Um, and I also, when it comes specifically to um, Spanish speakers, um, or uh, one of our, our things is like oral oral traditions of, of storytelling. So if you're working at a library, you'll have the example of someone will come to the desk and be like, bueno, like my neighbor told me that this and this, and, and you know, that you do this and this here. So understanding that cultural heritage aspect of communicating, um, I think it's important. So it might yes. seem like something like very, like very small, but it's actually something like very valuable and and helping them understand the services that you're providing to the library. So Latinos, oral storytelling is very important for us. So it's like that. It's like I feel that that should be something of of strategic communication when helping, I mean, we should be listening to all pages, but it's just under, understanding the listening and communication skills of, of of our culture. And that is, to me is is very important. And then I think that's why I was able to be successful in many um, programs in communicating with parents um, and students was because understanding um, their communication um, style. Uh, thank you, Elisa. And you have mentioned something that is very uh, important too. Is this... Um, Something that Elfrida Chatman um, researched 
and um, about small worlds and how we are all very linked and connected to our small worlds that could be our family, our neighbors, our our block, our friends, and um, and also how these connections, these conversations, right? Uh, in this case, when, when you are mentioning that, that um, the word of mouth, how we believe our friend and our uh, family member and the neighbor when they said, oh, the library has this and the librarian helped me. And, um, and so they are trusting that, they do. And we've seen they trust uh, many things, what they, what they say about the library, but they also about health and other things. But in this case, um, uh, libraries, and then they go to the library. There's another aspect, right, that um, we can throw in the mix, right, on how we um, actually then get to welcome these patrons that are coming from different uh, countries and multicultural backgrounds into the library. Um, David mentioned something very important as well that has to do with the uh, recruitment and perhaps retention of uh, library workers that are persons of color, or in this case, we are very specific today, uh, celebrating Latino uh, librarians and, and Hispanics in general. And um, it made me think that we need these support mechanisms that once we, you know, we, we recruit them and we hire them, um, that we can keep them, retain them as well, but we need to nurture them. We need to kind of like strengthen them and in, in, in their growth as professionals, because sometimes, um, and this is right a very old uh, story, but that repeats itself, unfortunately, we bring um, colleagues that are Latinos or from different backgrounds, and then there is not a support mechanism, or they are then immediately put in the um, EDI or diversity committee, and they might be the token, but they they maybe say, yes, I'm the token and I'm going to do this work, but then there is not um, uh, a mechanism to go further. So those are some limitations. And I wonder if you, uh, any of you had anything else to expand in that area, how we can then um, perhaps this, this is something that is studied during semesters, but maybe in this uh, moment, we have um, some highlights that can perhaps bring light into the matter for those that are with us today and those that will uh, tune into the recording. Um, I'm just going to jump in because I want to thank David for, um, for saying that, um, because that's just been something that I have seen throughout my career, you know, you could do all the things right, but if you don't have enough people, you're putting this big job on the few of us that are in this field that, that know how to do it. So um, I think the recruitment is, is, is important and a lot of people don't even see that. And then Loida, you're adding the, the retention. And even if you retain people, like I've been retained, but I feel like, to be honest, it hasn't been a such a great experience in terms of how I've been treated, which is, I think what you're getting at Loida is like, how do we treat hmm. Latino workers at every level? And how do we expect that they're not, you're not just going to bring somebody to be the outreach worker. Oh yeah. They're going to work with the community and just leave them there. When those are people that could be leaders in the library. Right. So, um, what pe I think what, I don't know who is in this webinar because I can't see. So I don't know who I'm talking to. And that's a problem. But um, if I'm talking to people that are not Latino, and I think is is people have to really deeply see their biases. Are you biased against your Latino colleagues? Do you think your colleagues are too loud, too much? They don't know English. They don't do this. They're unorganized. They don't know data. I mean, whatever you think, think about that. Why do you think that? Why, why are, are your Latino colleagues generally stuck? Like, like we have a few that are out, you know, they're wonderful that, you know, Camila was the head of her library. And, you know, we have these examples that, that you, that you were going to get to, but I just feel like, in general, the perception is that we're good for outreach, but maybe not for for leadership. 
what is the perception of professionalism, right? Right. We have to what, check that. What, what's considered professional? Like you and I, like when we see each other, we hug each other. And that, is that not considered professional? You know, exa- yeah, thank you. Are we too loud? Do we wear too much color? Do we <laughs> dance too much? So I will, Do I, I have will. an accent? You know, it's just what is it? What is the professionalism um, uh, rubric, so to speak, that yes. the lens, right? David, yes. I, I think that um, in following what Isabel said, you know, because there's so few of us in this field that is obviously greater than us, you know, we are always in competition, you know. A lot of institutions are looking for people like us to join their institutions, but, you know, we're all in direct competition because there's not enough of us to spread around and be able to, you know, fortify these institutions appropriately. And with that competitiveness, I think we forget that if you succeed, I succeed as a people. You know, we have to celebrate the successes of each other, regardless of what they may be. If you and I are up for a promotion and we're those Latinos and you get it, absolutely congratulations to you because you are advancing us together, because we are going to be on committees together, because we're going to get the work done, right? And I think that that's what we forget. And that's why, um, we sometimes, oh, you know, ella habla mucho, or, you know, she's, you know, she's, you know, she's a certain way. And I think it's because as a society, we've been, we've been conditioned to turn on each other when really we should bind together, celebrate each other, work as a group, as a team, so that we can move forward from all of that stuff, right? There's so much racism and um, discrimination, you know, I know in Mexico for sure, and a lot of, you know, in all of the Latino countries, because, it's the perception of whiteness. It's the perception of indigenous people. It's the perception of their dialect is different than mine. And still within, and something I wanted to touch on later about intersectionality, right, is we are all so different in our own person that there's not one Latino that's the same, obviously. So that should be celebrated as well. And now I'm going on a tangent because now you got me fired up, piece of it. <laughs> But it is, that's the beauty of Latinos. Yes, indeed. Um, we are very different. So there is not, um, and I said this uh, with a lot of affection, there is not, a, you know, we can't all be under the same sombrero. Uh, we are we are different. Um, maybe I have something that they call, my, my sombrero in Puerto Rico will be a pava. Uh, it's a different term. Um, and so, yes, we are different in that sense. And um, and once um, one one thing I, I need to mention: once you get to where you're going, remember uh, your Latinos and Hispanic um, because they carry you there. Um, okay, we have a question on the on the um, in the Q and A box. Let's look at that and. Um, we can continue. Um, okay, we have two. All right. So related to what David was saying, um, Elizabeth Cardoso Fernandez. I just started as a Latin American studies librarian a month ago, and I'm thinking of delivering general library instruction sessions in Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese, Optima, to remove barriers to access. Does anyone in PSI delivers sessions like this? Do anyone here on this panel has uh, any answer about um, library instructions? Yes, uh, Isabel. So, yeah, I'm in an academic library and yes, we have done it. I have done it um, and I'm going to probably start doing it again. I've definitely been working a lot more with Latin American people, but over the course of my time here, what I've seen is a sometimes the administration doesn't necessarily support it and it's not always so that's sort of what happened in, in my case why it wasn't a continuum you know and and it's interesting to look back and and david said you know make sure to to take that space right people of color it's our it's our duty to take space i feel like it, it that can be hard that that kind of became hard for me but i totally support uh doing doing that instruction in Spanish um definitely have done it definitely was appreciated um and um 
it, wherever you work, Elizabeth, um, let's see if you said that, um, they're lucky to have you. Indeed, I support that statement as well. Um, okay, do we have others? Thank you so much, Isabel. And um, we have a request here, if the participants can write in their chat, uh, the types of programs or services they are offering that are successful to the Latinx community. That is wonderful if we share that on the chat, those that would like to share. We're going to go into questions about that in a moment. Um, okay, is, uh, Elizabeth here answered that she works at the University of British Columbia. And so um, that's the their um, institution. Okay, so thank you. Now with that, that is perfect because now we're going to get specific. Um, how do you see Latinos, librarians, contributing to our society in the areas of culture, communications, financial security, health, immigration. And I started with these topics and we're going to take other topics in the next question. And it's to see if we have these examples, right? That could be collections or programmings, or there are ideas that um, us is in different type of libraries uh, can bring to the table. And all the different aspects we have shared so far can become items that we can consider for collection development, for programming for our Latino customers. Uh, these are all uh, a master class on how to do outreach in academic, public school libraries, and also in the different um, uh, programming and collection development. So um, we continue. All right, I will now go to Elisa and see how uh, she sees Latinos contributing to society in culture, communications, financial security, health, and immigration. Yeah, I think um, through our, uh, you know, of course, you know, intellectual, like uh, through, our, through our schooling and training, but also um, we will definitely, we are contributing to all those parts of, um, of, of society. Um, but I think um, also by celebrating our, our cultural um, heritage and just being authentic of, of who we are and being um, open and celebrating um, that, I think will definitely help us in that in that aspect of, of highlighting those things. Um, you know, there's so many ways that um, we are contributing with culture, whether we're, we're educating students, um, we're uh, developing collection. Um, newscasters on, on, on TV, on communication, you know, people who work in the financial and, 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 and as, um, field and stuff, which I, you know, I, I, I don't know, um, I don't know uh, much about that. And then of course of health and immigration, but I think it's all about just, um, you know, just bringing who we are authentically into the work that we do um, with our training um, and and all of that, but definitely just um, just being open and 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 to listening um, and understanding and and celebrating um, our culture within all of our all of our work and our and our ethics. So I, you know, so I think that's librarians and then the way librarians contribute is by providing the, the information right so we we make sure that the information that um our the folks are receiving is is accurate um it's it's you know um accessible um it's equitable and most important that it's the it's the right information so in whatever aspect or whatever um of those of those buckets that you mentioned on there, uh, that's how I feel. Librarians are contributing. Um, for me, I you know I'm contributing by making sure that students have access to um, materials um, that in in whatever language they they speak. Um, but specifically, I can connect with those students that um, are learning a, a second language because I was one of those kids. I you know my first library was the library where I actually worked, and I went there as a kid, and I I fully learned how to read English with Amelia Bazilia books so and then you know with the two girls that my mom like hired like um, Nancy and Jeanette um, to help me do my homework so I'm always grateful to Nancy right. and Jeanette wherever they are because they guided me to, to that so that's what I feel like like so that library the Grand Congress library contributed to my life without even without even knowing those librarians who helped me there because you know this is it became part of my career so 
Um, I know I went off on a little bit of a, of a tangent, but I feel that there's so many ways that we, um, we um, contribute to the fabric of Definitely. And um, they are, uh, I'm going to um, also interject here some examples I have on how uh, Latino librarians are uh, contributing to our society. For instance, um, partnerships are very important to provide this type of um, uh, programming and collection development specific to help, for instance, uh, with financial literacy that we can um, partner with the chambers of commerce or locally uh, to bring information on um, how to open a bank account. What is a checkbook? There are so many basic needs. We will know this when we talk to the Latinos. Again, it's not what thing I can bring, what program I can bring to the library. It's what they need, right? And so, um, yes, uh, financial literacy, there are details that for us, we take for granted, we almost were born with those um, kind of, um, of systems. But um, yes, what, how, how a bank account works and including also uh, what is this, uh, what are the transactions or paperwork I need to own a house or an apartment? What are the tenants rights? So these are topics that are very close to uh, this population. Latinos and Hispanics. During the pandemic, libraries uh, made uh, great contributions to their uh, communities in terms of uh, partnering, not only with local government, but also with other uh, not-for-profit organizations. And that has continued. I will say that increased during the pandemic and has continued to, for instance, bring um, screenings on diabetes, on health conditions that are prevalent in the community. It's not like I have an opportunity to bring colorectal cancer kits for the, for the Latino community. Well, do they need that? Is there a high incidence? So we have to kind of do our homework as well, right? Uh, there are some public records that are available in the health departments of the city. Sometimes they're available for free or you can have meetings with officers on how best to go about this because you want to bring um, books and materials and databases and programming that will be used by your community. And um, so those are some um, areas in which we can contribute to our um, the communities that we're serving at academic, public, and school libraries because academic libraries also have great opportunities to partner and collaborate with the different groups in the university and in the um, um, community where they are based to bring these services to um, the library through the library to the students. Um, um, Isabel, yeah. Um... So there's something lately that I want to talk about that I've been partnering with, um, and some of the leaders are in the community that's doing this. Um, many of them are Latino, um, Puerto Rican staff, um, some Latino students, and the, the movement is called Transformative Justice. And the reason this comes up is, it, there's a lot of reasons, but the reason, one reason is that because of racism against Latinos and especially, you know, dark skinned Latinos, but really racism can come up when a person hears an accent coming from a white, a light skinned Latino, but the accent itself can trigger a racist response from somebody who's, um, who's racist, right? So um, the transformative justice movement is looking at, you know, uh, issues of, Latinos winding up in prisons uh, or even winding up arrested for things that they're completely innocent of. You know, there's just a lot of examples of that. And that is an issue that libraries, I feel like we could really partner because that's something that there are people in our communities that are working on that. And we librarians can partner with them. Um, and so I've been involved with the transformative justice movement on my campus. Um, there's a reading group. We're trying to see, we know, how, how do we bring issues of justice uh, to the campus? Where is the injustice happening and how do we bring justice? And, and so part of it is a reading group, but we don't want to just read. You know, we want to see how do we take this reading and really make real change. So um, I would encourage people to see if that's a movement that's in your campus or your community. Yes, the incarcerated are also um, 
part of their community that many like in this case, public libraries serve, and they. Um, I have been in that position of uh, serving the incarcerated, and we did buy materials in different languages and also of interest to different ethnic groups. So there is another piece there in terms of um, there are certain collection development uh, guidelines that we follow, but that we also apply this um, the lens of the uh, Latino and Hispanic experience as well. Um, David. As uh, Isabel was speaking, I'm reminded of that concept of, you know, uh, they like our food, but they don't like us or they don't like our culture, right? Or our people. And I think that that's, that still resonates even as much as, you know, we've made so many strides, but in past, you know, um, presidential administrations and with the rhetoric that has gone out that surrounds people of color and Latinos, you know, it's still a barrier that we need to get through. But I do see, you know, a shift in media. There's a lot of media that's being uh, presented in with bilingualism, bi biculturalism, multiculturalism. With that in mind, look at you know, Bad Bunny was the first Spanish language album to win a Grammy, an English category historically. And that's showing the shift, right? That's showing the shift that information, people want the information they want um, to celebrate the culture in other ways as well. What you were saying about partnerships, Loida, with regard to, you know, financial security, health and immigration. It's, yeah, through the creation of connections and education resources. Media is doing such a huge job in that they're creating media um, in our languages with people that look like us, just like library reference workers, just like library folks that look and sound like us. That is digestible. That is something people buy into and that they can relate and feel safe for. You know, I can speak from personal experience. My father has a lot of health issues, and it's because growing up, he never had medical professionals who he trusted because he didn't feel like it was necessary for him to get regular medical checkups, um, to get his diabetes checked, stuff like that, that we take for granted. Um, and you know, those are the communities that we're serving. It's those people that we need to um make connections with and provide the resources and information so that they can get their quality of life. Really, that's what we're looking at, right? So um, with regard to how Latinos contribute to that, it's really we're connecting people to all of these resources, to this information so that they can get there so that, you know, we don't just have that bunny at the top of the English charts. We have, you know, we're at the height of all um categories, sections, departments, areas, because of the work that's being done. Fantastic, right? Branching out also from only um, cooking books or, or biographies uh, for uh, our populations, right? We have to um, um, consider other areas. We do have uh, some questions on the Q&A. Um, has anyone experienced cultural barriers between Spanish and Portuguese in collection development? This is very interesting. I know very rustic Portuguese to, to purchase books, but not, I have not, I can I can't say I have experienced that. But um in the in the community I worked at, we did purchase um Spanish and Portuguese separate collections, separate programming as well, uh, dancing, and also uh, sometimes doctors to speak in Portuguese to the community because that's what we have there, right? It's not um, a magical formula. We bring this program for everybody according to what they need. Um, so uh, in that sense, I did not uh, experience any barriers. Anybody else here from our speakers that have some um, something to say about that? It's very specific, but I hope that at least um, is helpful. They are very distinct uh, languages and groups. I, I buy a lot of books um, in Portuguese um, for different reasons. So um, in Massachusetts, where one, we have some of the oldest Portuguese immigrant populations, um, so it's a very important language, but we don't have any native Portuguese speakers in my library. And so, you know, I don't have hiring authority, but th th I definitely feel like it needs to be addressed in communities like 
like myself and like this community. And I know there are other parts of the country where Portuguese is an important cultural language. Um, so it's important for people to remember that. Um, we have a lot of people from Brazil in Massachusetts. It's not, we have Portugal, Brazil, and um, Cabo, Cabo Verde. Mm -hmm. um, and um, luckily the, it's, it's, the professors are, are very attuned to, um, you know, the whole Lusophone world. So it's not just Portugal, you know, um, but it's a, it's a good question. So thank you for the question. It's good for people to remember that. Yes. And they are very, uh, also, uh, they are, um, differences in uh, Portuguese, Portugal, and Brazilian Portuguese, and even Cabo Verde a little bit as well. And so, yes. Um, Another question is if an employer had to choose between hiring a Latino with English speak skills or a native English, native English speaker with Spanish language skills nowadays, who will have preference among U.S. employers? There are many components that come into play too, you know, is um, there are things like moving. Is the person in the city, can they move? Is the library providing um, um, reimbursement for expenses? So that's important as well, uh, besides the, the uh, possibility that the um, potential staff is available. And, um, but maybe um, uh, David or um, Isabel or Lisa have uh, something to say since they are more hands-on. I will say that there are many Latinos that are native English speakers. So um, the preference should be given always to build equity on your staff and to be intentional with your recruiting and to make it a mission to um, make space and a uh, place for Latinos and people of color on your staff. Now, that is a personal practice for every institution. I don't know what the preference would be for everyone, but that would be my preference. Okay, thank you. And I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, there is a contribution of an example on the chat on the Q&A. Please um, look it up. I understand someone is compiling these examples, so that's great. We are winding down, and before we go, I would like to um, talk a little bit if may, maybe one of our speakers uh, can have some examples in terms of how they see Latinos, librarians and libraries contributing to um, education, gender equality, inclusion, and well-being. I can kick it off. Yes. Um, Loida, so um, one of the things that I would like to see, I would love to see um, more uh, Latinos, Latinx um, colleagues in collection development and, and becoming um, selectors. I think um, we we definitely make a, a, a difference and bring a rich um, perspective on things, um, just like all of our respective colleagues. But I think our experience of knowing like the culture, the language, the diversity of that is very um you know, definitely very helpful to developing and selecting um, titles that will be put in the hands of all patrons. So let's just talk um, in, in general, not just um, specifically for students. So I would love to see more people uh, that look like me um, and like us um, making and having buying power um, and decisions in in these and, and developing um, these collections because the the power of your library is it's in many things, but definitely in the in the collection that you build that reflects the community that you're serving. So not just stereotyping um, the titles, introducing what they need, buying what they need, but also introducing them to new materials and and experiences. So definitely, um, I would love to to see more people um, that look like me. I still get asked the question, oh, do you speak Spanish? Oh, you are, oh, you're like, oh, so where are you mixed with something else? Or, you know, like those types of, of, of things. But um, but yeah, so definitely that, I think we have so much to contribute. contribute. So would love to see um, definitely um, more people that, that look like me um, having, becoming selectors and, and building out um, not just collections and libraries, but in museums and, and, and being part of, of special um, collections. And, and I think, um, and I will stop here. I also want to jump in and say that um, 
A good practice, again, is continue with the partnerships. And there are women's group in your community that might be the Colombian circle, the Ecuadorian women, the uh, Mexican uh, tejedoras. Uh, remember, Latin America is composed by 20 plus countries. And so we have to also be mindful who is in our community so we can then plan accordingly. It will be great if there will be a formula, right? You say, oh, I'm going to bring this, this program here and it will be good for all the Latinos and that's it. But um, really the most uh, responsible thing is to get to know who is in the community, the organiz uh, social organizations that are already in place and that can actually be gatekeepers that can welcome you to their groups and then through them you can welcome people from those groups in the library and um, so they are yes specific groups sometimes sometimes they are very general just the latino women group so then that's great you can connect with them but it's very important to take that those steps and uh, take the time and effort to then provide programs about you know promoting and supporting gender equality the well-being perhaps of the laborers that work maybe two or three three times um, uh, work um, and shifts during the day um, and also to promote and support their education. Um, David? That was all really great, Lloyd. I was listening <laughs> and I was like, I, I agree with what you've shared. I think that those are great examples. Um, I want to just echo what I mentioned before in that um, we should be reminded that Latinos are a varied, you know, people, you know, we all have our own experiences, just like Elisa said, strong Latina women are at the core of who we are as people. You know, I was raised by strong Latina women and I am better for it. You know, if we don't celebrate the intersections within our culture, right. You know, uh, people who are, bicultural or multicultural who people who are you know maybe half white and half you know latino in you know those are what make the beauty of being a latino right it's part of our identity and um because of the celebration of that more recently i think we're able to start making more moves into uh positions of leadership and in you know, celebrating community workers and even, you know, serving like on your neighborhood board or something where, you know, we have a little bit more ease to do that. Um, I don't know if that answered the question, but that's what I was thinking. That is great. Um, I'm going to move to the last question because we perhaps um, are now kind of um, getting to the end actually, but perhaps we have more to say about one area that it's uh, very important to this um, celebration, I will say. And um, let's revisit the contributions of the Hispanic population that have been integral to the development of the United States. And what are the notable contributions of Latino librarians to support our society of reform? And we have the president here. We have Isabel also that presided. We have Elisa, she was president of the chapter of the Northeast chapter. And so um, there are some things that reform adds has done for a long time. It's a great tradition. And um, what we also have um, amazing leaders and elders uh, to in whose shoulders we stand. And um, I will ask Isabel to start and Elisa and David close. Oh, there's so many different people through Reforma. And I like the way you had asked us to look at people in leadership and then look at people who are experts in you know, collections or programming. So, and then I also want to think about people that are not may even that well known, but were very important. So Judy Rivas, I don't know if you ever met Judy Rivas from the Northeast. Yes, 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 yes. She's a Puerto Rican. She's from a small town in Connecticut and she was a powerhouse. She unfortunately died um, uh, young uh, in her, I mean, for, she was in her late fifties, but she got involved in city government and she was involved in her, I mean, she was just amazing. She did, I think, win one of the Reforma local uh, awards. But I just want to like, 
I know there are many others and we don't, we're not going to have time. We're running out of time to say everybody's name, but I want to say at least one name there. Um, and then, you know, right now I'm very impressed with um, people like Aide Hodis and Roxana Benavides. They are creating a transnational encuentro between librarians in Southern Peru and the United States, and they're just doing it. They're just inventing it. Yes. <laughs> you know? yes. And I am helping them with whatever I can. You know, I took it to Salam and I said, you know, could you support these people that are doing this amazing, amazing thing? And lately, I've also been getting involved with Salam which is, for those who that don't know, it's the Seminar for the Acquisition of Latin American Library Materials. And they're more academic, but there's some amazing people there as well, like Sara Aponte from the Dominican Studies Library and Paloma um, Celis Carvajal, who is involved. Um, she's with the New York Public Library as well, but she's she's done really, really amazing things. And then there's people like Max Macias, who I just really respect. So I just want to put those, I'll leave those names because I know there's more, um, there's not enough time and in, in, in to give everyone else space. Thank you. Lisa. Yeah, no, definitely. There are so many of, of us and so many people that I look up, up to and I stand on their shoulders um, that we could, be here it could be a whole webinar on all of those folks but um i think one of the people definitely i look at pura Belpre and her and her work and her her inspiration how she went um she went out to her community um and just dedicated herself and found what the needs were of of her community and the people that um that were there, but also introduced other members of the community to what it was to understand, um, you know, uh, Latino folk tales, um, what are called cultural heritages. So I always wanted to be like that type of librarian who was there with the community and understanding the needs, but also learning from the people and teaching them probably about, um, you know, my culture. So yeah, so I can sit here and name so many colleagues that I stand on, but when I base my work on that, I look back to the person who I feel really started it all for um, for us um, Latino librarians. So, and definitely something that I do not take um, for granted. Yes, Pura Belpre, one of the uh, first Latino librarian in New York City. David, you have more than those two minutes that, that are on the clock because um, we want to give some time. Yes, so um, branching off of Pura Belpre, you know, we we honor her and her memory and her work with um, Reforma establishing an award, a liter literary award in her name in 1996, so that Latinos, Latino publishing, Latino illustrators, writers could be celebrated in the same way as Caldecott, Newberry, so that we can continue this legacy um, to show Latinos are here to stay. We have a lot to contribute to the world of the arts and in literary uh, spaces, and we do this every day. In addition to Pura Belpre, um, Reforma is known for its Noche de Cuentos, um, you know, thanks to um, many uh, librarian storytellers um, that help us create these events and create many grants so that we can uh, provide these programs across nationwide libraries that celebrate storytelling, this um, idea of the narrative, right, the Latino storytelling, um, our cultural narrations, how we uh, pass on legacies um, from generation to generation. And also uh, Reforma has been instrumental in um, helping Dia de los Niños become a global, a national um, initiative across libraries as well. We also offer many grants that uh, provide libraries the opportunity to create these programs in their spaces. And these are all because of the work being done by library professionals that are Latinos, who are uh, advocates for the Latino people, who have been partnered with um, uh, teachers, educators, writers, um, patrons, people that love libraries and who are advocates for libraries. So uh, that's in short how Reforma um, is helping with those um, contributions. Latino librarians are indeed contributing to the fabric of the nation. We are contributing to strengthen uh, 
uh, or social cohesion uh, to strengthen the society in different fronts. We are active in policy. We are active um, in the different um, setting trends that are also affecting our world and libraries are part of that world. We are also um, supporting access to information and freedom to read every day with what we do. And we want, I would like to say, um, to, uh, to thank everyone that attended today's event. I would like to also thank our speakers, uh, the San Jose State University High School for hosting and um, all the attendees, because you are part of this amazing uh, conversation that has covered programming, collections, issues, successes, challenges, and potential uh, solutions and to how to move forward our world. So thank you so much, everyone. And happy Hispanic Heritage Month. And I see uh, Dr. Shao here. I wonder if he has final remarks. Yes, thank you. Uh, so everyone, I wanna uh, please join me in thanking Loida and our distinguished guests for just an amazing session. Uh, we've all learned so much. Um, a couple of including thoughts. So first, uh, David brought up really a great point about the, the interesting uh, responsibility children have to take care of uh, their parents and family members that may be immigrants to this country. Uh, and I think that's such a great point, really resonates with me as well, David. Uh, and this really identifies, I think, a clear way that libraries can support immigrants and underserved, upper-represented people through our services, recognizing the fact that there is that dynamic for children in particular in those situations. Uh, and I can definitely say that it's not only a complex situation, uh, oftentimes it causes a feeling of inadequacy uh, and even shame for your parents or your own culture or, culture or your own home to not be American enough, right? And so I do think that's such an important point uh, and, I, and having someone that lived in live as someone that lived in libraries when I was a kid, uh, you know that that really resonated with me. Finally, EDI is everyone's responsibility. Uh, today just reaffirms that uh, we must ensure we provide the space and resources to bring people together to discuss a different way of thinking, living, and being, uh, which really lifts us all up. Um, instead of insisting we all be the same, or that others be more like me or you. We must do the hard work to see the world through other people's eyes and cultural lenses. Our differences and similarities better define really who we are as individuals and as Americans and helping us all become more of who we are and who we are meant to be. This is tough work. Success in achieving a brighter future is tough and will be realized with a lot of barriers, criticism, and also oftentimes a sense of not being good enough or not doing enough. For example, this EDI series has been criticized uh, for not being good enough uh, or not doing things uh, in ways that other people think we should. But so be it, because striving for and having the courage to promote and create positive change is well worth the effort. Uh, and this is how we succeed together and make EDI more normalized in our culture uh, and society. So I also want to thank our wonderful staff. So part of our commitment to EDI is, of course, asking our staff to to do a heavy lift on top of their day jobs. Uh, Vivian Zuo, our events coordinator, Nicole Perviance, our uh, head of marketing, Alfredo Alcantara, who is with us uh, in our uh, uh, Zoom guru, uh, your, uh, Iori Tokunaga, our EDI student writer, and even Michael Crawford, who is the uh, uh, one of the head of communications for San Jose State. So many of you may not be aware, but this is live streaming right now on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Uh, through San Jose State's um, wide network. And by the way, one of the reasons why I love working at San Jose State, because we not, we not only talk about it, we do it. Uh, and we allocate our time and resources to support EDI. Um, our full transcript and recording uh, and a summary of today's events will be posted on our website. And, and Alfredo, if you could drop that link there, uh, and that usually takes a couple of weeks. Also, would like to ask you to consider subscribing to our YouTube channel at SCSUISchool.edi because this is our third year now. We have just tremendous 
uh, privilege and tremendous content uh, across uh, various uh, cultural heritage symposiums. Uh, our next one will be the Native American Heritage Month on November 3rd. Uh, and again, afraid if you can drop that link uh, and then followed by uh, the Black, uh, Black History Heritage Month in February. Uh, and although we haven't identified a keynote speaker yet, I'm sure it will be someone uh, very uh, impressive. So again, thank you so much for your time, Loida. Thank you so much for what an incredible event. And uh, thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful day.